Well, hello there, and welcome to the very first edition of Lancaster TV here at Birmingham's NEC for the 2019 Classic Motor Show. Uh, and I'm here today with uh, Dave Youngs, Lancaster Insurance Car Club Manager, and Paul Wager, the Group Editor of Classic Car Buyer, Classic Car Mart, and Classics World website. Um, so, gents, I wanted to talk about 1984. Um, there were some big things happening in the world. The, the, the Hapney coin was phased out. Uh, Torvald and Dean uh, won at the Olympics. Uh, the Thames barrier opened, and therefore London was no longer a, a flood-ridden city. Uh, a bit closer to home, the Birmingham Airport got a new terminal building. I've done my research, Dave. Um, <laughs> and uh, more close to my heart, Thomas the Tank Engine Air for the first time, you see? So it's all good stuff, right? So I think that's the, uh, that's the key. But um, more significantly, I suppose, um, uh, Lancaster Insurance came into being, and the Classic Motor Show also started in 1984. So it was a, it was a big year. But Dave, I thought it would be quite useful if you um, gave us a little bit of background about Lancaster Insurance, because it started out, I believe, just catering for MGs, is that well, right? Course, yeah, we were part of the MG Owners Club, uh, and we were known as MGOC Insurance, and we exclusively insured MGs. Uh, after a period of time, it then went on, we, uh, we transpired, we were actually quite good at this uh, insurance law, uh, so then looked to insure other makes and models. And it has, it's changed enormously, isn't it? Because over that 35 year period, um, Lancaster Insurance's products have um, evolved and expanded to cover all makes and models, all eras. I mean, you really do branch into so many specialist sectors now, don't you? Oh, we do. I mean, from going working with one insurer, insuring one make and model, we now work with 11 different insurers on 25 different schemes. Um, you know, from 100, 200 vehicles to now insuring over 100,000. The, the growth over that period of time has been phenomenal. And in your and in your role, you get to speak to the owners clubs that represent a lot of these makes and models. So you've really got your finger on the pulse, haven't you, about those specialist markets? Absolutely. We work with 300 plus owners clubs. Um, you know, so we, we've constantly been fed back. Yeah, you know, what we can do better. Yeah, you know, we feed back into the business. The business transforms. Absolutely. And Paul, as, as someone who's probably done a fair share of these classic motor shows, as indeed I have. Um, have you noticed any sort of uh, changes at the shows um, over those years? I think it's become more enthusiastic, if anything, and certainly the quality of the cars on show is far higher than it used to be. I came to some of those early shows, I was pretty young myself, obviously. And, uh, <laughs> yes. the, 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 we were all the, young months. The quality of the restored cars in particular is absolutely top notch nowadays. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the show itself has expanded massively. I, I'm, I'm sure the attendance has virtually doubled um, in the last five to five, ten years alone. But I've also noticed the variety of cars has expanded. So you go anything from pre-war uh, to more modern classics from the 80s and 90s. Um, there's a real proliferation of, of makes and models. And, uh, and that's what I think is great about this show, is you come to it and there's always something to appeal to almost anybody, really. And again, I guess that's why Lancashire Insurance wants to be involved in uh, an event like this, because it does cover such a breadth of, uh, of cars. Absolutely, it's absolutely the, the largest event in the calendar. Yeah, the, the biggest event that we do all year, we, we see this, the season close up. Um, but like I say, the huge variety of vehicles on display is, uh, is unbelievable. And you're out at lots of events throughout the year, so I mean, how does the Classic Motor Show compare? Well, we, I, I personally attend 30 to 40 events per year. Wow. As, as a business, again, we attend just as many. Uh, this is the absolute pinnacle of the year for us. It is the biggest event we attend. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we probably believe it's the biggest event in the UK that exists. Looking back at 1984 then, when uh, Lancaster Insurance came into being and the Classic Motor Show um, happened, I want to sort of bring it back to the cars if I can, because actually, I've reflected on this. I think 1984 was quite a key year in many ways. Um, it was the end of Triumph as we, as we know it. Um, by then, the, the brand was very much just um, TR7, which was nine years old by that point, so a pretty ageing car. And of course, the um, rebadged Honda, the Triumph Acclaim. Uh, so Triumph sort of ceased to be in 1984, um, and Austin Rover was sort of percolating at that point. So you get the new Montego, the Rover ST3, which is effectively a Honda Ballad or Ballard or whatever they call it. Um, perhaps a more telling sign that you wouldn't see the fruits of until later in the decade was that in 1984 it, Nissan signed the agreement with the government to build the plant in Washington up in the northeast. That then precipitates the growth in the Japanese um, dominance of the market and how Japanese uh, car sales really took over from some of the British cars that we would have bought in the 70s, 70s and 80s really. It was a pivotal moment for the British car industry. The resurgence of manufacturing began at that point. Mm. They started before long they were exporting cars back to Japan. Not only Nissan but Toyota and Honda eventually were sending cars back to Japan. That's right. Proving that we can make decent cars of quality in 
and they sent the be they set the benchmark for that build quality and product development was accelerating all the time. I mean, the Japanese were always bringing out new cars every six or seven years, whereas something like the the Metro, of course, which celebrates its 40th anniversary next year, um, you know, had to. It, even when it was launched in 1980, effectively, it's a reskinned Mini, um, and it had to soldier on with the A series engine until 1990. Um, and then, even as a Rover Metro, it was still quite a basic car by then. So, and, and, that, and it soldiered on as a Rover 100 until what 1997. Like amazing, amazing, you know, unbelievable, unbelievable. It was that late. Yeah. That's the sort of the, the 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 key part of that era, really. I, mean, I don't know if any of those cars uh, feature big in Lancaster Insurance's customer base. The sort of that. British era versus Japanese cars versus Ford Vauxhall. The, 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 the 80s was an absolutely fantastic year for cars, um, and yeah, those cars are now becoming hugely collectible and hugely valuable. Yeah, and obviously the 80s spawned yeah, pretty much the hot hatch uh, as we know them today, the Golf GTI, yeah, the absolutely. XR3i, the XR2, they, they were all, you know, they came from the 80s. They, yeah. Yeah, they really were great days for car manufacturing. Yeah, you're right, the sports car kind of died away a little bit in the 80s. Obviously, MG. Uh, stop making cars in 1980 and the hot hatch era was then upon us wasn't it because let's say um, I think the celebration 40th, 40th anniversary of the Golf GTI in the UK here uh, this year um, right at the end of the decade Land Rover launched the Discovery and that took on from the hot hatch yeah that's right yeah that's what we have today. yeah well that sees a sort of a diversification of the different types of cars no longer were you just buying a saloon a hatchback and an estate car you had many more uh, choices I suppose yes. don't you but um, coming back to the Lancaster insurance stand you've also got you know, a significant presence at the at the event. I want to sort of cover off perhaps a highlight from from the stand, and we'll come to that um, in a second. But you've also got a theme this year. You've got uh, top trumps, which yes. I think we all remember as kids. Absolutely, we we all played the game when we were younger. Are you actually doing a top trumps game here? We have. Yeah, yeah. We've selected thirty of our favourite cars from over the years. Um, yeah, we, we, you can see the one on the wall behind us. We've got the Australian X5 up there. Um, but no, people can buy the packs, they can play the game, it yeah, really is a bit of fun for this year. Fantastic, yeah, well, I always remember long school trips on the coach playing top trumps, <laughs> sort of trying to pick the most powerful car or whatever, the one with the fastest top speed or yes. 0 to 60 time. The fact that those 0 to 60 time now are probably dwarfed by a, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Renault Clear or something is neither here nor there, but, uh, but anyway. Looking at the Lancaster Insurance stand, I just wanted to pick out a, a, a car from, from it, and it makes sense to start with the um, Mazda MX-5 we've got over here. Yes. Um, of course, it's 30 years, <coughs> excuse me, 30 years this year that the Mazda MX-5 was unveiled. I don't think it went on sale until 1990, if, I'm, if I've got my history correct. Um, but um, it's such an iconic car. When we talk about the 80s being the decade of the hot hatchback, you could argue that by the 1990s, the hot hatchback, the bubble had burst, ironically probably because of insurance premiums, because you know people had sort of Very bought lovely. them yes. um, and, and bashed them and thrashed them, and then that meant insurance premiums had to rise accordingly. Um, and suddenly affordable sports cars became very much um, yes. what was uh, what was sort of flavour of the day. But this particular example, Dave, this has uh, been a project car that we featured in Classics Monthly. We have. Um, and um, perhaps you can just tell us a bit about it. So we, we originally bought the car back in well, February last year, February this year even. Yeah. Um, it was our, our project car, which we will you know, we'll give away to one of our lucky competition entries this year. Uh, we hunted high and low. We particularly wanted one in Mariner Blue because it's absolutely our favourite colour of the MX-5. We, we came across this example, which is in particularly good condition, but unfortunately carried an automatic gearbox. But actually the condition of it was alright, wasn't it? it was, yeah, the condition of it was alright. And, and, and as an automatic gearbox car, it actually drove okay. Yeah. Yeah, for a sports car with an automatic, which is just totally wrong. Um, yes, it, it doesn't really go well, does it? It no. probably does, does well in Tokyo, but not very well in Telford, I'd say. Because so, we took, I was we, adamant from the start that that automatic gearbox was coming out, the manual box was going in. Uh, even after and have you, you, it, you've driven it with the, auto, uh, with the automatic gearbox and I, the manual gearbox? I've right? tried to probably three, three, four thousand miles with it with the auto gearbox and have probably done another two thousand on, on the manual box since. And you must be happy then, is it, is it, is it a good it's, conversion? Is it? It's an absolute joy, yeah, the, the conversion has really made the car into yeah, what it should be. It really suits the character of the car, doesn't but it? But do you know, I was surprised how good it is with the automatic. I was pretty cynical about it, and actually I quite liked it with the automatic. And I surprised myself with it. Yeah. I wanted to hate it. So I did just I. merely mildly could, could bring myself to. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> well, we took it all the way down to Land's End, didn't we, to we mark did. uh, 300 issues of um, Classic Car Buyer, and um, that was a, a really sort of key uh, key road trip. And 
I don't know, it was, I, I thought it performed really well, even with the auto box, I think it was still a lot of fun. Do you take it to loads of events throughout the year? Yeah, absolutely. Win? The entrance will close when this event closes on Sunday. That's the absolute last And then we announce the winner when? We will choose the winner next week. Uh, we will be in touch with the winner next week. It will be announced to the public mid-December. Excellent. So we'll be able to see the big unveiling. Because last year you did a Golf GTI. We did. Yeah. We went all the way down to Eastbourne to uh, deliver that to the lucky owner. He, he was a real Volkswagen fan, wasn't he? He turned out he owned, actually owned a Mark II, So that was proper sort of uh, postcard stuff, wasn't yes. it? Really? And, uh, and I guess we're going to make plans for another competition car next year. We have. We've, we've chosen. Uh, we have another competition car ready for next year. Which but we're, we're not going to unveil it yet, are we? In due course. In due course. Yes, very exciting. We'll keep everyone in suspense in the meantime. Absolutely. But I don't think people are going to be disappointed. Are they I don't think so. so. We're, we're very, very excited about it. It's a car I've not driven since my youth, and Excellent. it's an absolute pleasure to be back behind the wheel of one again. So uh, let's just great keep that one. So the risk yeah. will be keeping you off, you know, behind the wheel. You've got to sort of get you back behind your your desk. The, the thing I wanted to sort of move on to was um, our highlights of the show. Really, um, it's only day one. We've probably not had a huge opportunity to walk around the show but um, are there any particular highlights that have uh, sprung out? It's it's always a highlight, the, the show is always fabulous, I've, I've had a look around Hall 1, I've managed to have a quick look around Hall 5, uh, tomorrow I'll get a proper look around the show. Right, okay, <laughs> yeah. What about you Paul, what have you, what have you spotted? <laughs> well I got, got here early and had a good look around and um, I found something I've never seen before which is unusual and I was editor of a Ford magazine in the 90s, I found an Escort RS Turbo, it's in the auction here. It's, it's a non-custom model, which I've not seen before. So it comes with wind-up windows, no sunroof, and no central locking. It's a left-hand drive Spanish car, but it doesn't have air conditioning either. I was quite surprised to find something that I've not seen before, and I've been coming to this show a long time. So that's quite rare. Like you say, it's a, this is a Mark III. Series 2 RS Turbo. So uh, were they just lower spec in, in other markets? Is that? I'm going to have to find that out now, aren't I? Get, get your geek <laughs> on, about it. That's what you need to do. Get your geek on and go and look it up. So, I mean, I've... Likewise, I've not had a huge chance to look around the, the show, but I, I did do a quick kind of walk around. I've said there's so many people here, it's a bit hard to sort of uh, uh, get around uh, in any great uh, speed. But um, I did sort of have a little wander around, and um, I, I spotted uh, there's a Panther Solo on the Panther Club. And it's the Solo 2, so it's got the sort of slightly quirky concealed lights, so that they, I think they rotate to reveal those lights. And it's got like Ferguson four-wheel drive running gear or something. Sort of yeah. like and then I sort of wander a bit further into the show, and then I see something as beige and as bland as the uh, Morris Town <laughs> on the uh, Pride of Ownership stand, I think it is. It's a really sort of mint, um, I think it's a 1.3 HL, like dull as ditch water, really. And, and back in the day, that would have been a pretty poor car against its competitors you know there would have been plenty of better cars out there and yet I see it there on the stand now yeah. and it looks I think it looks incredible well it's um, better than when it was brand new like yeah it. right yeah because well, I think you know, how many were built yeah you consider outside of a car show when, when did you see one exactly I think bizarrely marinas have probably sort of survived them longer but I guess they were on sale for longer a lot of these cars go through periods where yeah, they, they, they reach the bottom of the values the values are in hundreds yeah, yeah. they're going to need welding they're going to need work the cost of the word doesn't justify keeping the cars on the road. And isn't that a challenge, you think, with the with the modern classic era? Because I think everyone's getting quite dewy-eyed about 80s and 90s stuff increasingly because, of course, you know, next year marks the 40th anniversary of 1980. So, I mean, that makes us all feel a bit old, doesn't it, unfortunately? But I think the survival rates of cars built in the 80s and 90s is actually quite scary. So, I mean, something like a Triumph Stag, I think has survived in really high numbers, but I can't imagine an equivalent car of the 80s surviving to that level, that proportion. That's the scary thing. And then of course you had things like the Scrappage Scheme of course. 10 years ago, where there would have been certain cars of the 90s that were worthless, where if they could guarantee themselves a £2,000 Scrappage allowance, that probably wiped a lot of cars off straight away, didn't it? So That's a threat that's coming back. Just this week in Classic Car Bar, our lead news item is the proposed diesel car ban in Bristol, which is backed by a new scrappage scheme that may come into force very soon. It'd be a real shame if we lost those sort of era of, of cars. Yeah. No, I, think, I, I think it will. I mean, the, the challenge will be go and find me a Toyota Carina. Yes. Yeah. Where would you look? I think They'd have sold hundreds of thousands of them, but yet yeah. th there's hardly any around, is yeah. there? So um, it's interesting on our stand, we've got a, a 1989, I think it is, Honda CRX. It's gra grabbing loads of attention because it's just so rare. I bought that car at auction and I had to bid off a 
think I've been against quite a few other customers too. So secure it. And, and that kind of era of car, Lancaster do, do cover, right? So we do indeed. Yeah, so we, we call them a modern classic. Um, and we've got specialist schemes available to those. But you're not using them every day, they're still fairly low risk. And, and, how, and how, how, how do you determine it? Because it is hard, isn't it? Because there will be certain, in quotes, modern classic cars <clears throat> that can legitimately be used every day yes. and therefore probably don't qualify for the scheme. Um, so, you know, what are we looking at? Mileage, club membership? We're looking at, yeah, club membership, limited mileage schemes, they, uh, they both offer a discount. Um, if, if you are using it as an everyday car and you are looking for 20,000 miles, maybe it's not a thing. Um, but if it is a second vehicle, you use it on your high days and holidays, 3,000 miles a year or so. Great, I, I, think, I think there's a real appetite for that and I also think that's where a lot of the younger enthusiasts are going to come from as well. Like, they're going to get excited by it about an MGF aren't they and in fact um, our uh, production editor Aaron's picking up an MGF this weekend yeah, I've converted him to a cause as well that's yeah, right yeah, yeah they really are great they, yeah, they're One of the great we've value for money as well and you were saying something about a hydrogas conversion now yeah, or not conversion well, the, um, they repair it right? yeah what was threatening a lot of the MGFs uh, out of existence really was the, uh, the lack of availability of new uh, hydrogas fields and um, now uh, someone's commercially remanufacturing them which is going kind to of, I'm sure a lot more of those cars stay on the roads for a lot longer, which is pretty good. Well, it could be the next MGB. Well, that's, that's, that's great news, isn't it? Because, you know, in a way that brings you back to Lancaster's roots, you know, catering for yes. the MG market and yes. to have the MGF and the MGTF um, to be able to survive because specialists like that will either do coil spring conversions, which actually makes it ride less well than the hydrogas version, or repair the existing hydrogas, means that MGFs and TFs are going to um, survive well into the future, which uh, means that's going to be a a good classic car to, to follow both sort of now and in the future I'd say. So I think that's probably us done for our first episode I don't know whether we've um, gassed on for long enough but uh, it's been a lot of fun chatting cars with you guys oh, we're going to catch up again tomorrow uh, day two hopefully we'll have another chance to have a look around the uh, the show and uh, follow some more so uh, Paul Wager group editor of uh, Classic Car Buyer Classic Car Mart and Classics World uh, Dave Youngs uh, the car club manager at Lancaster Insurance thanks for uh, joining me on this uh, general wittering of all yeah, things classic cars <laughs> and uh, we'll do it again tomorrow hopefully so uh, yeah thank you